G'day guys, welcome back to another Eagles Corner video. Today I'm going to be talking about some West Coast Eagles that I expect to kind of take their game to the next level to some extent in 2024. Now, doing this video for a young Eagles list who have 22 players under 22 or whatever the stat is, is difficult because there's a lot of plays you can make the argument should improve, right, in a linear sort of way because they're young and getting more experience and developing physically. Uh, so I've had to be somewhat selective with the players I've chosen in this video and I'll give some justification for those ones. So there's naturally going to be some players I miss out, but what I've decided to do is mention a bunch of players that I'm kind of going to leave out of this video and sort of rattle them off at the end and highlight why I've picked the ones that I have. Now, straight off the bat, one player that I'm going to leave off this list is Elijah Hewitt. Um, if you've been watching True Footy for a while and particularly my Eagles Corner videos, you'll know that I'm a huge fan of Elijah Hewitt and he would normally be uh, in this list. However, uh, it does appear that he might be out of football action for a little while, unfortunately. Picked up a bit of a foot injury. Apparently, he's been carrying it for a couple of years. I've forgotten the word for what exactly it is, but you can find it on their, the Eagles website. They've done a, a video and an article about it. So I am a little bit concerned that we might not see a lot of Elijah Hewitt. So we're just going to park him aside uh, in terms of 2024 chat. Um, now, last year, if we look at which players probably really did take their game to the next level, there's, there's probably a number of players in a certain age bracket, sort of like that 21 to 24, 25 age bracket last year that kind of really did take some strides. I did highlight it through the course of the year, but Oscar Allen is the biggest example, you know, because he had such a good year, we forget that prior to that, he really hadn't had that breakout moment. Season 2022, he didn't even set foot on the field because of a foot injury. A couple other players worth mentioning, Bailey Williams, I think really stood up and played well beyond his years and experience as he sort of hit that 50 game mark, or I think that's where he sits now. Jermaine Jones is another one that seems to have really risen his game to a certain level that I really like. And a bit of a younger one is Brady Hoff, particularly at the back end. Like, you know, In particular, I want to say July and August, we saw him take his game to the next level. And I want to highlight Jake Waterman as well. But we'll go through which players I think will elevate their games big time in 2024. So I will be double dipping on a couple of these. And the first one I want to talk about is Brady Hoff. And the justification here is that, yes, last year I just highlighted him as a player that did improve in a big way at the back end of the year. But I'm talking about a prolonged period of improved performance from Brady Hoff. I'm expecting a much more consistent year from him. I'm not saying he was inconsistent last year, but I'm just talking about a really big increase in both output and consistency for Brady Hoff because he's entering his third year. He's played 30 games now, and uh, some of the stats here are interesting. So he, he won about 15 touches a game, playing pretty much exclusively as this medium sort of versatile defender who can play on medium types as well as smalls and for a six foot three kid, and he might have grown looking at some of the photos. Uh, he's looking pretty tall these days. His ability to play on small forwards, in particular his performance against Charlie Cameron at the Gabba, really showed his versatility. Uh, but with the ball in hand, 15 touches a game is solid, but his disposal efficiency was 85%. Now that is well and truly elite. And from the eye test as well, I just remember feeling very confident whenever Hoff had the ball in his hands, they would hit up a target with those medium sort of length kicks and weight them beautifully. And I think that is his Arguably, he's one would. If he's if he's also a good lockdown defender to some extent, and he's a really good user of the football, I think we've got an absolute beauty on our hands. And as a guy that will move from 30 games to 50 games, you'd hope at some point in 2024, I think we can expect this might be the year that Brady Hoff really establishes himself as a good young player of the comp. Now, to what extent is he going to build a profile in the AFL? I'm not too sure, but I'm looking at it, and I think this guy could probably have a year where he establishes himself in the 22 under 22. It's about time we start getting some Eagles back in that list. And, uh, you know, I look at his last game where he had 26 touches and 12 marks against Adelaide. And I think that hopefully is the sort of standard we can expect more consistently from Brady Hoff in 2024. Now let's talk about Ruben Jinby. And uh, this one is a guy that I think everyone is expecting to Im improve dramatically in 2024. And I, I would probably urge us to temper our expectations a little bit because I just think when you're expecting a, a 19 slash 20 year old to come in and play the role he does, I think it is going to take him longer than we expect to really build up his output. That being said, it doesn't mean he can't improve massively on last year because when you look at the numbers, he started 2023 really well, had 12 tackles on debut, which is outstanding, uh, 20 touches in his third game, that was enough to win the Rising Star, and we did see his output decline slowly over time. I, I presume he just got a little bit fatigued, understandable, he's playing a very crash and bash role as an 18 year old in a team that's getting slammed. Uh, so that being said, so what, we, what I expect from Ruben Jimby is probably just to raise the bar of consistency a little bit higher and get through the season in much better shape. We know he's in ripping condition at the moment. Uh, we did go through a deload 
load period in the preseason because he's probably working too hard. So that's the other danger we have with Jinbi. He's an incredibly hard worker. So getting him you know, fit and comfortable at the level, I think a reasonable expectation for him is to have about 20 touches a game. If he's getting 20 touches a game, on average, I think that is a very, very good year for a second year inside mid. Uh, considering he only averaged 14 last year. Now, the tackling game is outstanding as well. And like I said, I think he's actually got to the point where Ruben Jimby does add something different to our team as a teenager because of his defensive mindset in the midfield, I suppose. I looked it up. He had 16 tackles against Gold Coast. I don't even remember that. 16 tackles in a game is... That's beyond elite. That's like up there with some of the record holders. I don't know what the record is, like 18 maybe. But we get the kid fit and firing, you know, preserve him throughout the year, maybe rest him every now and then. I think we could see a big improvement in his output. I also want to talk about Jake Waterman. Now, Jake Waterman might be one of the more slept on West Coast Eagles by fans internally, in my opinion. And there's one other guy I will mention as well. But I think Jake Waterman, you know, I've always been a little bit ambivalent to him. You know, I never, I was never anti-Waterman or anything like that, but I kind of always just thought... He was 50-50 to become a long-term player. But I think what we saw in both March and April of 2023 really made me think, wow, this guy's matured quite a lot in both a physical and mental way. You know, round two, kicks four goals against GWS. Not long after that in Adelaide, kicks four goals against Geelong. And then there's another game against Port Adelaide where he had 23 touches, 10 marks, and a goal. You know, that sort of pace is outstanding. And we know mid-year... Well, the team also felt to shit. Like, he got diagnosed with that um, illness that he had. I forget the term again, sorry. But, you know, I think he was named centre-half back in that game, which kind of just is symptomatic of how crazy last year was. But I just think if, we, if he can recapture that, that pace that he was setting in March and April, I think we could have at least a long-term player here at West Coast. And I did say we should temper our expectations because he's been ill, dropped a whole heap of weight, but it does sound like he's in ripping nick at the moment. Where's his body strength at? What's his muscle mass like at the moment? I'm not too sure. But, you know, if he could become a, uh, a link-up marking around the ground sort of guy, I think he might be a little bit of a surprise packet, provided he gets through the season with a degree of fitness. So I am going to be keeping an eye on Jake Waterman for sure. Let's talk about Noah Long. Uh, it's another interesting one where I think all Eagles fans love him and think he's a gun. Uh, but anyone who doesn't watch West Coast and simply looks at the stat sheet probably thinks like, what the hell are you on about? Because his stats on paper don't sound amazing. Uh, he averaged about 11 touches a game as a small forward last year and just kicked the seven goals from 19 games. He did come ninth in our best and fairest, although you also factor in that best and fairest was a shambles last year because so many people missed games. However, I think all Eagles fans can pretty much agree Noah Long is the sort of guy when he gets the ball, something good happens. And when he's doing that at 18, you extrapolate that and you think, wow, we could have a pretty special player here. What sort of role he ends up long term, I still think more of a forward player. Um, who could probably roll through the midfield a little bit. I don't think that's going to be on the menu for 2024. So we're looking at him as a pressure forward, a hard-working forward. He could potentially play higher up the ground, be a bit more of a playmaker. And I, the other things I noticed about Noah Long, I've said this before, but I think there's been a physical transformation there when you compare it to like when he arrived at the club. He's looking a lot more cut, a lot more angular, a lot more masculine, dare I say it, which doesn't mean he's going to play well, but we, you see there's some upside there. He's starting to mature physically as well. And, you know, we get a little bit of access on the Eagles YouTube channel. We can see him talking and him being very animated and he's got a bit of leadership about him, which I really like as well. And it just strikes me, strikes me as the sort of guy that will do everything to get the best out of himself. And so I don't foresee any second year blues for Noah Long. I think we are going to see a bump in improvement. Will that mean he gets 20 touches a game? Probably not. But if he gets 14 and a few more goals this year, but is still doing that thing where everything he touches turns into a score involvement, it feels like, then we'll be in a very good place. The next one I want to talk about is Jack Petrocelli. Again, similar to Waterman, sort of in that age bracket where I feel like in 2023, when I saw him play, even though the stats weren't indicated, I just saw a very different player to the patch that we first drafted. Uh, a much more you know, physically strong, composed and clean Petrocelli. 12 touches a game doesn't sound like much, but I do remember several times throughout 2023, just moments where he would sort of rip the ball out of a, of a stoppage and get an explosive clearance that would end up in a goal. Uh, he would, I remember uh, several like good overhead marks, which is not something I'd previously you know, associated with Jack Petricelli. Even some like heroic rundown tackles. Like I feel like Petch is this sort of impact player that uh, really did make us look better at times in 2023. And I know that sounds like a really glowing endorsement, but I really believe that. And I think maybe he's never going to be this guy who runs through the midfield permanently, but if he can be like an impact midfielder who plays predominantly forward of the ball, and you know, we've seen him run off halfback as well, but I think if he simply averages like 17 or 18 touches a game, I think with his composure, 
there is a chance that he becomes a very good player. Now, I do I do accept that he's probably a bit more of a long shot than some of the other names I've noticed on this because he is getting to that age where we kind of need to see that deliver. But I also think that he has been playing in the years where he's starting to hit his prime. He's been playing in a team that's an absolute shambles. So I'm kind of intrigued to see if we can get a stable team going playing in a fairly cohesive game style, and Petricelli has a clearly defined role, I think there's genuine upside there. He kind of reminds me of like a, almost like a Richmond-esque player where, you know, you think of some of the best players at Richmond during their dominant era, and then you look at the stats, and you're like, oh, he only gets like 18 touches a game. But if you watch him, they're actually good players. And I feel like Petricelli has a bit of that about him. So uh, he's just one I've quietly been a convert on, and I'm hoping he has a big year. The last one is Kobe Bergeel, who to the more casual Eagles fan, you probably don't know much about because we drafted him in the second round of 2023 and hasn't played much football at all. In fact, when I looked it up, I was surprised to learn he only played three games of Waffle last year. On the positive side, however, he had 20 disposals in all of those games, averaged four marks. And I do remember, I didn't watch those games specifically, but I do remember reading a lot of reports about how he just looked a little bit of a class above. And he is going to take a little bit of time, obviously, to adjust to the pace of AFL. But I think that's a really good sign when a player comes in immediately at a certain level and looks like he is already ready. What we can expect from Bergil is like really good composure and speed out of the back half. And I feel like he could be one of those halfback distributor types. And he has the attributes to be a very, very good one. So... I would like to see him get an opportunity. We had a bit of a scare, um, you know, a few weeks back, it was reported that he'd done a hamstring. Now last year, he'd, he had a season ending hamstring surgery. It sounds like he's back, like I think he's training again. So a little bit of misinformation there. So all things being equal, I don't know if Bergil would start round one. I'm half expecting him to just start the waffle season really well and actually earn a spot in this team because I've heard really good things. I like what I see in the highlights. And I think from an attributes point of view, he, he does add something that we don't quite have in the back half, particularly in the under 22 sort of category. Cool, so those are players that I've just named who if they get a good run at it and we're not a shambles of a team, I expect to see some real improvement for. And you've noticed I've obviously left out all the first year draftees generally. Uh, so we'll talk about some players that I'm still a little bit hopeful about. Um, a couple of players I mentioned in the um, players who need to have a big year for West Coast video. The Edwards brothers, I know they're not actually brothers, but Harry Edwards, I'm still somewhat optimistic. Not optimistic enough to put him in this video because I can't say that I really believe we're going to see it, but I'm hopeful that he can recapture that form before he started having all these injuries and become a half-decent key back. I'm still hopeful on Luke Edwards. I think there's AFL traits in there. Again, Luke is probably another victim of the team being such a shambles last year that he had to play in different roles, you know, in a clearly defined role. I think he could improve rapidly. Jack Williams is an interesting one. I think there's a chance that maybe he doesn't start the season in the AFL team. In fact, I don't think he will. But I thought what we saw at AFL level was encouraging enough. And I will say I was a little bit surprised he only got a one-year contract. So what I expect from Jack Williams, though, is I expect him to at least play, I don't know, half a season in the waffle, depending on form and fitness. But I could see him really elevating and becoming one of the better waffle key forwards in the comp this year. Ideally, Again, this is all predicated on fitness. And the fact that I have to keep saying that shows that the, the PTSD, like I, I keep thinking we're going to get injuries. I've got to stop thinking that way. But, you know, when he ended the season in the AFL team, you know, I thought he looked pretty damn fatigued. He ruptured his spleen last year. So form and fitness notwithstanding, I think if he plays in the waffle, I think we could see a good year of output from him and he could develop physically and uh, eventually make himself more ready for AFL. But I, I would like to think he gets another contract after that. Jai Cully's a player I've also left out. I'm a little bit tentative just because of his ACL injury. Now, it does sound like he's going to be close to fit by round one, which is outstanding considering he did his ACL in May last year. That being said, I'm just tempering expectations with Jai. If he comes back round three or four, starts in the waffle slowly and starts to build a very well-rounded game where he's you know going forward, applying defensive pressure in the midfield as well, winning a bit of the footy, I think that would be a nice positive year for Jai Cully. Uh, Campbell Chester is another one. Again, I just want to limit expectations to some extent. I'm, I am genuinely optimistic about Chesser. I'd say I'm more confident than not confident that he is going to make it because of the, the turnaround in form we saw from him in the back half of last year where he just looked a little bit more composed, you know, taking that extra second to look inboard, hit a target. Whereas in the first few rounds, it felt like every time he got the ball, it was a little bit hot potato-y. So for him, I have no idea if he starts round one. You know, there might be a chance that the Eagles 
match committee seem to rate him so much that they will play him in round one regardless. I have seen us do that with previous draftees that maybe didn't seem quite ready. Maybe Venables, she dug in. We, we really invested in these players early. We could do the same thing with Chessa, although it's equally possible that we think the, the best course of action for him is to build up some form in the waffle and I'm willing to be patient. So I'm not going to set any expectations on Chessa exploding or anything like this year. I think all the other players I mentioned have more reason to genuinely lift their game, but I would like to see Chessa put in some consistent footy in the waffle, winning 20 touches a game and uh, using the ball well. I think that would be a great year and hopefully he gets a look at it at AFL level at some point throughout the year. Anyway guys, that is my take on some Eagles that I think should improve. Again, you know, there's so many because we've got such a young list, so you'd hope that more than half the list is going to at least improve. Uh, but that being said, I would like to hear from you in the comments what you think about what I've said in this video, but also your thoughts on any other plays you think will improve this year. As always, I appreciate you watching. I appreciate you being subscribed and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.